the sky at night, now on BBC One with Patrick Moore. Good evening. Well, the great English eclipse is over. I'm afraid we were clouded out, but we have some magnificent pictures sent in, and I'll show you a selection of those later on in the programme. But first of all, I think it's time we pause to take a look round the sky. What can you see for yourself? And there is plenty to see. So, in the evening sky now, let's begin with the Summer Triangle, made up of three bright stars, Vega and Lara, Delium and Cygnus, and Altair in Aquila. They're still quite prominent, and of those, only Altair actually sets over Britain. Now, the name of the Summer Triangle is completely unofficial. I gave it in the Sky at Night program, I think 40 years ago now, and everyone now uses it. But of course, that applies only to us. In the Southern Hemisphere, it is the Winter Triangle. And here's a view, as you see it now, from Sydney and Australia. The triangle south are there, all right, but of course, Altair in Aquila is now the highest of the three, and Deneb and Vega are low down. Also there you see constellation of Pegasus, the flying horse, and that's also seen from our own hemisphere, and really, Pegasus is our main awesome constellation. Easy to find now, high up in the south after dark, and the four main stars make up a square, and they're very easy to find, even though some people expect them to be smaller and brighter than the square really is. In mythology, Pegasus was a flying horse. And there's the picture of the horse in a rather undignified, upside-down position. Now, the four stars in the square had been given names, uh, Alpharats, Algonib, Sheet, and Markab, and they are not alike. In fact, if you look carefully, particularly with binoculars, you see that three of them are white, and the fourth one, Sheet, is orange in color, and that shows its surface is cooler than the rest. Also, sheet is slightly variable. Sometimes it's a little brighter than the Markab, a little fainter, so look tonight and see just how it is. Now, bear in mind, the stars in the square are not really connected at all. A constellation pattern means absolutely nothing, because the stars are at very different distances from us. And here are the distances in light years. As you can see, Alpha 72, Algolib over 400. And that means that a constellation is merely a line of sight effect, and there are the distances uh, relative to the Earth, as you can see, Algonib right in the background. And although Algonib appears the faintest of the four stars, in fact, it's much the most luminous. Well, such is Pegasus, and leading away from there, the constellation of Andromeda, made up of a long line of fairly bright stars. And one of those is called Almark, or Gamma Andromedae, slightly orange, an interesting star, just about as bright as the pole star, and it looks normal enough, but take a telescope, and you'll see our mark is double, has a companion, and that makes what we call a binary system, and the two really are associated, going through space together. And in fact, the fainter of the two is itself a very close double. But the most interesting thing in Andromeda, unquestionably, is the Great Spiral, M31. M stands for Messier, the French one of Charles Messier, drew up a catalogue, weighed 781, and this was his number 31. And this can be seen with the naked eye as a very faint patch, but not going to show it well. And photographs taken with a large telescope, well, here it is. And that is well beyond our own system. That is a separate galaxy, more than two million light years away. We're seeing it, therefore, as it was more than two million years ago and it really is large. Our Milky Way galaxy contains roughly 100,000 million stars, and M31 is larger than that. Therefore, I wonder how many Earths are in that thing. Also, it's spiral, although the spiral is not well shown, it's Adrianus, but other galaxies do show the spiral form even better. Here is the Whirlpool galaxy, and the hunting dogs, close to the Great Bear, further away, and this really is a magnificent spiral, as you can see from this picture here. And in fact, the spiral forms of these were first seen by the Earl of Ross way back in 1845 with his huge 72-inch homemade telescope he set up at Burr Castle in Ireland. And I'm glad to say 
that grand old telescope has now been brought back into use for the first time in 1999 and is fully functional again. And uh, by 1917, it was in fact the largest telescope in the world. And Lord Ross used that to study the spiral galaxies. Also on view are the two giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn. They rise in the late evening and they are quite unmistakable. Of course, a planet shines only by the reflected sunlight, but they're bright and Jupiter far outshines any star. Telescopically, they're lovely. Jupiter with its yellowish, flattened globe, its belts and its four bright moons, and Saturn, the lovely planet with the rings. Those rings made of millions of tiny particles of icy material, all spinning around Saturn like tiny satellites. And Saturn does have a whole family of moons, and one of these, Titan, is of special interest, was at this moment, the space probe is on its way there. So there's plenty to see in the night sky. And I think for time for a few news notes, and plenty is going on. Let's begin with our familiar moon. The lunar prospector probe has been going around the moon, and has now been deliberately crashed into the moon near the southern pole, and for a very special reason. Some of those craters near the poles have their floors always in shadow, so they're very cold all the time, and there have been suggestions there might be ice there. All right, crash down prospector, drop debris, and try and find evidence of anything watery. Well, no results have come through, and frankly, I did not expect them. About lunar ice, I'm a complete and utter skeptic. I just don't think it's there. But in one way, we have been proved right. Dedicated lunar observers have long been saying that on the moon there are very mild outbreaks. We call them TLP, or transient lunar phenomena, and many people were skeptical about these. They have now been finally proved. Ernst van Dolphus has found an obvious TLP inside this crater here, Languidus, and now we now know that although anything on the moon is very mild, the moon is not totally inert. Though, of course, any major outbreaks there go back for several thousand billion years. From the moon onto the red world of Mars. Not well seen now. It sets very soon after the sun, but it's very much in the news. The Mars Climate Orbiter probe has been going there and dipping in and out of the Martian atmosphere and slowing itself down. And the Mars Global Surveyor probe has been going round and round, taking photographs of the area near the Martian South Pole where the Mars Polar Lander will come down this December. A flattish area, and you can see there an impression of it. There's a map of the area, you can see the landing site it is. This is a most suitable place. And again, a more detailed view. And that, um, that purple ellipse there indicates the possible, uh, the possible landing site error. So, well then, we'll look for ice. Will it find any? No little green men, I can assure you. We're looking for a very primitive single-celled life, and it may or may not be there. I think we'll know for certain only when we obtain actual samples from Mars and bring them back for analysis, but at the moment, I'm 50-50. I hope it's there. I can't be sure. Polar lander may help us at least in finding out. A different kind of probe, Cassini-Huygens, now on its way to Saturn and its big satellite, Titan. It's just past the other over 700 miles and is now on its way out there. And we hope we'll drop a probe, Huygens, onto the surface of Titan and find out what that curious world's like. It may come down on ice, or rock, or even a chemical ocean, we don't know, but it won't get there until the year 2004. I promise you that then we'll bring you all the latest news from the sky at night, so on its way, Cassini-Huygens. And again, a totally different probe, Chandra, the X-ray satellite, now successfully launched and has sent back its first results. And the first thing it sent back is a picture of the radio source Cassiopeia A. And here's an optical picture of Cassiopeia A. You know what it is? It's the wreck of a supernova, a star that blew up centuries ago, and the other bits spread around as you can see. And here is the X-ray picture sent back by Chandra, and there appear to be two expanding shells, a fast-moving inner shell, heating the gas to fantastic temperatures, and a slower-moving outer shell that may be a sonic boom. And right in the middle there, you may see a tiny speck, and that could be all that's left of the old star. So certainly, Chandra has started well and will carry out a full survey of the sky at X-ray wavelengths. Different again, safety at home, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and uh, people have now joined in with their own PCs, and we now accumulated uh, 50,000 years of computer time trying to pick up intelligible signals from deep space. So far, no luck. It may happen one day, and in the foreseeable future, we'll give a complete program for this until how you yourselves can help in this search. 
And now, back for the last time to that eclipse, August 11th, 1999. Well, I was at Falmouth with the Nicholson and Peter Catterbell, and sadly, we were clouded out, but others had better luck, and we're showing now a series of pictures. First of all, from Newquay, where it was clear, uh, David Davis had some nice pictures. There you can see the moon surrounded by the, the, uh, the prominences and the corona, certainly on a cloud there, and the outer corona nicely shown. And there the diamond ring as the eclipse ends. Well, he was lucky. There was one tiny clear patch and it passed over Newquay, but it did not pass over us. Paul Cooper was also lucky. He was in Cornwall and he got two good pictures. There we see the diamond ring, certainly not a cloud effect there, and the prominences nicely shown. At the Lizard, Tony Brand took a video. Rather interesting, it was cloudy, the clouds suddenly cleared away, and there suddenly was the eclipse sun. It must have been very dramatic. Now, that was England, and in most of Cornwall and Devon, conditions were pretty bad. They were better elsewhere. Chris Doherty was on a ship off the French coast, and he got this picture. You can see the eclipse ending there, and you see the promises and the corona very well. Also on the same ship was Bob Turner, and Bob got some really lovely views. There's one showing the prominences. And just look at that. That prominence there at the right actually being cloned clear of the sun altogether. Remember, it was a good time for prominences because the sun is now approaching the peak of its cyclic activity. And we expected these things, and we certainly got them. On Alderney, conditions were mediocre. Little cloud was there. They saw it, but not very well. But Helen Walker was there and got one very interesting picture. Strange strips were reported across the sky. Not only that, but else also where. And there is one. You can see it quite clearly. And what exactly is it? Well, frankly, we don't know. Can it be anything to do with an aircraft trail? But um, it's not been seen before. And I say, it is very much of a mystery. We'll have to see whether they're seen at future eclipses. Then, uh, away from Britain, over to France, at Reims, Kenneth Campbell took one very good picture, again showing the outer corona. And over here, Dave Carter took two pictures. There's one, there's the eclipse sun, and below to the left you can see a speck of light, and that is the planet Venus, which showed up very well indeed. Also, he took pictures of the curved shadows cast through the leaves of a tree when the sun was a crescent form, and you get those at every eclipse. Also in France, Lee Arnold took this picture, and note those prominences. Well, I think myself that the prominences this time were better than at any recent eclipse. They really were superb. Germany, mixed fortunes there. At Munich, it was actually raining, but there was the one break in the clouds, and some people had the strange experience of seeing the eclipse sun when they were sheltering from the rain. But conditions over in Romania were really good, as you thought they might be. Kevin Smith was there and took a lovely series of pictures near the end of the eclipse. There, the diamond ring increases, and then the corona fades away. Steve Ford also got two very good pictures from Romania. Conditions there were good. Here are Steve's pictures, a diamond ring, and a very good one showing the prominences. But of all places, probably the best results of all came from Turkey, and John Grieve was there with three superb pictures. Again, the corona, as you can see, that one, and the prominences there, and one of the diamond ring effect. Also in Turkey was Douglas Arnold, so well known to us all, you, you expect him to get good pictures, and he certainly did. Look at this composite showing the eclipse over a Turkish mosque. That was worked out after, of course. And then the pictures themselves, digitally computerized, the structure of the corona and the prominence is there. Different exposure, strike even better brought out. And then the prominences and the chromosphere, as you can see. Different exposures giving different views, and then coming in once more. As you can see, the corona structure there is beautifully shown. Back to the prominences. That must have been a glorious effort. Well, what about then the partial phase? Over most of England it was clear, and some good views were obtained. Uh, John Watson sent these pictures. Here's the start of the eclipse, and note one thing. There, just below the center of the sun, there is a sunspot. And note that the sunspot is not nearly so dark as the moon's limb. And that's because a sunspot is not really dark at all. It appears black, but it's seen against a brighter background. Actually, a sunspot on its own would shine as bright as an arc lamp, and you can see that effect there. And later on, uh, John Watson took that picture, over 90% total, but of course not quite. At Cardiff, 
Jonathan Gill had good views of a partial face and sent back three good pictures. The crescent, same crescent, nearly total, but not quite. I wish our skies at Falmouth had been as good as his. In fact, they weren't. We were clouded up, but we could undertake experiments. And one of these, by Ian Nicholson, involved radio. Radio waves are reflected from the Earth's ionosphere. And at night time, this clears, and you can very often pick up distant stations you can't hear in the daytime. Would the eclipse have the same effect? That's what we wanted to know. Well, ours are never negative, but Chris Davis of the Rutherford Apple Laboratory has had reports in, and in various places, the reception did improve, and the effects were seen elsewhere, so this was an important experiment. Also, bear in mind that in things of this kind, negative results are important. They tell us a great deal, and this radio experiment was a useful one. Also, down at Falmouth, Peter Gattemole plotted the changing light. And you can see that his curve there, a sudden drop in totality, it was quite eerie, believe me. And David Parker had his weather station working. You see here, solar energy in yellow, temperature drop in orange, and interesting that temperature lags solar energy quite markedly so. So the experiments were useful, and they all worked very well. But what about us down in Falmouth? Well, about 10 to 40th century, we did have one brief glimpse of the crescent sun through cloud, and that was all. At totality itself, well, there we were, sitting under umbrellas in the rain. But believe me, an eerie experience, a sudden drop in temperature, a sudden strange darkness, unlike anything I've seen before, everything seemed to stop, and uh, quite uncanny. And although we didn't see it at Corona, it really was a most moving and a fascinating experience. And I suppose all we can realize is better luck next time. And our next time could be in 2001, when the track of totality begins off America, crosses Africa, and then crosses Madagascar. And there are various other eclipses before 2005, and shown here on this world map, and we hope to see some of those. And I like 2003 in, in Antarctica. We got to wait and see on that one. But before that, there are various partial eclipses of the sun next year, not total partials, and uh, we won't see them here, but one occurs on Christmas Day, 2000, and you see that from parts of Central and North America. So, our next total eclipse in England, a long way ahead, but we can promise you one total eclipse of the moon, and that is on January the 21st next year. Now, a lunar eclipse is quite unlike a solar eclipse. What happens is the moon passes into the shadow cast by the Earth, Sunlight's cut off, and the moon's in the dim, often coppery color. And there's a picture of a partial eclipse, but that of uh, next January is going to be total. Interesting to see, so let's hope for clear skies on January the 21st next year. Meanwhile, if you want the latest news, tune to our website, www.bbc.co.uk slash skynet slash, or cfax page 620. It's been a great fun, and again, bear in mind, there's so much to see. If it's clear tonight, do go out, find the square of Pegasus, look at the orange sheet, find Jupiter and Saturn, and you'll agree there is plenty to see. So until next month, good night.